Hello, everybody. Welcome to week three of the Level Up Symposium. My name is Andrew Scriver, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to digital presentation formats and taking your show online, presented by the Associated Designers of Canada with support from Toaster Labs Mixed Reality, Mixed Reality Performance Atelier. This event is sponsored by CITT Alberta. I'm one of the co-curators of the symposium and a member of the ADC, and I am very excited to be your host for this event. I'd like to first acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Chochage, the unceded land of the settler city of Montreal, which long before colonizers arrived was a place of conference, conflict and creativity for many indigenous peoples, including the Ganyangahaga, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat and the Abenaki peoples. I am honored and humbled to be able to be here to create and share with you all. And so I offer my thanks. So in the spirit of gratitude, I would like to first acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, who is our primary funder of the symposium as a whole. And again, as I said, our event sponsor is CITT Alberta. Thank you so very much. Uh, we'd also like to thank our other sponsors, IATSE, the University of British Columbia, Theatre Alberta, Concordia University, Ryerson University, York University, and of course, all of our individual donors. Thank you all very much. For your information, all symposium events will be recorded and presented in a freely available archive on our website within a few days of the event. Check back. Thank you for joining us today. So you're either watching this live stream on the Level Up website, levelup.designers.ca, on HowlRound at HowlRound.com, through our partners at Toaster Lab or on the respective Facebook pages of the ADC or Toaster Lab. Regardless of your viewing platform, embedded on the same page as the video is a chat function in the top right-hand corner of your window. Uh, you can click on the little speech bubble. Questions can then be asked in the chat at any time, please, and will be read out to the presenters. So this event can be enjoyed through auditory or visual access or a combination of both. I will read aloud all questions that we address from the chat, and this information will appear visually at the bottom of the stream. Visual access is also supported with captioning for all speakers. So captioning will appear directly below the active speaker, as you can see. Uh, if you require technical assistance to support your access, please email levelup at designers.ca for immediate support to provide feedback following the events. Uh, if you enjoy this session or any of the other Level Up sessions, please consider donating anything that you can to the Associated Designers of Canada to support our national arts service organization in achieving its goals of advocacy, mentorship, and industry promotion. Donation links are available on all viewing platforms, which is our, our website, the ADC's website, or on canadahelps.org, so please consider donating. So thank you for your patience with all of our announcements. Uh, it's now my honor to welcome our guests to this event. Uh, so first up, we have Ian Garrett, who is a Toronto-based designer, producer, educator, and researcher in the field of sustainability in the arts and culture. He's a director of the Center of Sustainable Practice in the Arts, an associate professor of ecological design for performance at York University, and a producer for Toaster Lab, our partner. Uh, we're very, very happy to have you here. Welcome, Ian. Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> Next up, we have uh, Logan Raju Cracknell, who's a Toronto-based lighting designer and live stream artist, who found that his pre-pandemic hobby of live streaming has transitioned into a useful skill. And not just useful, but necessary for the continued survival of our industry. So welcome, Logan. Very happy to have you. And uh, next up, we have Frank Donato, who is a video designer currently residing in Kingston, Ontario. He's a frequent collaborator with live digital performance company Spider Web Show. Uh, and recently, Frank worked as a live stream technician for their Festival of Live Digital Arts, otherwise known as Folda. And he now leads the beta testing for their custom browser-based performance and rehearsal tool, Canadian Studio. Welcome, Frank. Hello. Uh, hey. Hello. Frank and I went to school years ago. It's very happy the first time we've seen each other in years. I'm really happy that you've managed to join us here. Thanks. Happy uh, to be here. Lastly, we have Emily Susanna, who is a award-winning video and production designer based out of Chochage. They are a graduate of the National Theatre School of Canada Sonography Program, University of Ottawa's Theatre Program, and they spent time as a projection technologist at the BAMP Centre. They are co-founder of Potato Cakes Digital, a production design and digital arts collective, and are also a digital dramaturg with Playwrights Workshop Montreal. Also one of the co-curators of the festival. Welcome, Emily. <laughs> Hi, nice to be on this side of the stream. 
So here we are, digital presentation formats. That's the question that's been on everybody's mind, I'm sure, for the last year. <laughs> almost, How almost are we doing there. this? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's one, of the, one of the brilliant parts is that we, you know, we're, this is a very meta conversation. We're streaming our, our streaming. This is also one of the other channels. Hello, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, sorry, Andrew, I, I jumped in there. No, no, not at all. Please. Yeah. Are we ready to talk about some online presentation formats? I think that we are. All We're right. all here for this. We're all here for this. Uh, so yeah. So this is this is mainly a uh, a um, like meant to feel like a relatively casual conversation around uh, the way that we're working now, so that we can start to talk about like everybody who's on this call has been. Um, uh, has been dealing with this sort of pivot. We've we were before the call talking about issues related to um, different types of hardware and different types of software that we're running into, and some of it may or may not have been planned, right? And and so this is meant to be like, okay, here are a handful of people who are working on getting things online who may or may not have been planning to do this uh, literally one year ago today. None of us may have thought ourselves to be in this position, but we might have been involved in streaming in some way. And so this is to dispel like the fears that people might have in getting involved with that. Like everybody here I think has some experience uh, with that, whether or not they intended it to do uh, to be part of their theatrical practice or not, um, or have been somehow active in telepresence in some way. So, and is anybody like, am I, am I wrong there? Is there uh, Emily, you were you were at this a year ago, right? Yeah, I mean, like, I think that all of us here were, and video designers in general, were, like, primed, I think, for this sort of, like, streaming revolution. Like, there's a lot of skills that are sort of directly transferable, like, are, do you have basic networking skills? Do you know how to set up a camera? Can you get your video from like one place to another in a reasonably HD, reasonably high fidelity format? Um, so like when everything started to flip on its head, um, I know that like I was excited about being able to explore all these new avenues, mm -hmm. uh, but also it meant that like, and I feel very privileged and very fortunate to say this, but there's been like quite a lot of work for I think everyone in our sector of, of the field. Right. How did you, how, what was your first sort of streaming experience? How did you get involved in streaming? I'm gonna ask you first, just because we're already talking, but Frank, <laughs> Logan, you're asking, yeah, I wanna know from you next. So that's, that's warning. Um, so, I mean, I can't remember the first time I streamed anything ever, because I think that was probably some point like 10 years ago when I was like, how do I do this? What's Twitch? Uh, but uh, my first streaming experience in the pandemic was uh, very early April, NTS released uh, like a series of micro grants for artists who like wanted to do something. And so Andrew and I actually applied for one to uh, projection map our living room wall. So if you see behind me, uh, when we moved in, I was like, do you want to be cool hexagons? And I like painted our wall to be covered in hexagons. So we applied for this grant to projection map all the hexagons on our wall and then do this like live VJ set. So the pandemic had only like shut us down by about like a week and a half when we were like, oh wait, we could like make art and send it out to everyone. Uh, and then I sort of deep dived into like, what's the best way to do this? And we were working with a composer who was in Mont or in Toronto and we're based in Montreal. So it was like, he wanted to play live to what we were doing and then the visuals would react to his music. So it was like, how do we get high fidelity, low latency audio from Toronto to us into touch designer, back out to our streaming computer, then out to everyone. How does it look good? How does it sound good? Um, and then also like all the like touch designer and all of that right. stuff, like the actual art. Um, yeah. But I think that was sort of like my first streaming experience, like in 2020. Right. Frank, what about what about you? 
You've yeah, been involved was, in CD and studio for a while, right? Yeah, I was uh, very lucky to be the video designer for The Revolutions, uh, which was the first public performance by Spiderweb Show in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, and that was in 2017. We, um, Joel Adria, who works with Moment Factory, developed this wonderful program. Uh, it was called CD and Studio. It's now called Sketch Space. And it is a real-time um, collaboration tool on the internet. And at the time, uh, we were kind of bound by a couple uh, barriers that Google and the internet was just at in 2017. Like we're so much further now. In the last year, we're so much further than we were in 2017. 2017. So we were dealing with uh, latencies and times and getting signals across. Uh, and we were working with actors from coast to coast of the country. We were in Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, Kingston. Uh, we had digital actors, we had live actors, we had a live audience. Uh, so that was a, a massive challenge to, in as little latency as possible, connect all of these people around the country and present a live presentation to a live audience. Uh, so that was my first venture into live streaming. And uh, it was, I guess, sorry, it wasn't necessarily live streaming to the audience, it was live streaming actors into a show that was happening live to an mm. audience. Uh, so I guess it was a little different that way. Yeah. Uh, but that was my first venture into the internet as a performance tool. Cool. And Logan, I feel like I feel like I it, sometimes I've strong armed you into streaming on the theater <laughs> side because I feel like you have a lot more experience as we can sort of tell from your your very high end <laughs> setup that is very, the, the sonography of your streaming experience is, is uh, much higher than than ours is right now. Yeah, so with my streaming experience, uh, I started and still stream on Twitch. Um, it started with just like video game streams with like a okay webcam and stuff from whatever i had set up and as over the year i started it just before the pandemic hit you know beginning of january i was like i want to do this thing and then suddenly it started to become like oh theater this the main thing that i do for a living has now had to transition to a digital platform uh how do i take those skills that i have and the tools that i have here to to transition to that so i think the first bit of I'd say like performance art that I started doing uh, that wasn't my own stuff through through live streaming um, was with a, a company in Poland called Festival. They do uh, digital tours of Polish or Jewish areas of Poland. Um, and it was helping them create this tour in a way that they could then like they do it as a, a streamed presentation through Zoom. Um, and it was lining up all these things and a lot of the, the stuff I had just stumbled upon through Twitch kind of ended up helping that out um, in terms of things that I've learned, just like kind of like the, the what we needed to prioritize, like what does the audience right mm -hmm. away grab is like, this is off to them. Um, and it's like, how do we focus on that and then get the rest? Yeah, it, it, that reminds me a little bit of. I mean, there's a sort of similarity between a bunch of the a bunch of different experiences, right? That um, uh, like uh, I didn't think that I would be doing this with theater per se, but like my uh, my introduction to streaming had to do with like distance participation with things because I have this like focus on ecology. And so there've been like years of like, how do you do a conference mm -hmm. where someone can re participate remotely? And, uh, and we used to like hack together things with Google Hangouts and they're like, oh, you can get 10 people into a chat room. How do we make it so that people can use that? And they're involved like specific companies and then working with uh, HowlRound a bit to figure things out that when the pandemic happened, like we thought we were being super ambitious with them. Um, I was working on a project with the NAC um, for the, uh, this project around the cycle on, on uh, theater and climate change. And we were like, we're going to make it so that people don't have to fly to Ottawa to do it. They can go to these eight different places to do it. But now we have to figure out the link ups between each of those spaces. So we spent like months doing that. And then like one of the last things I did in a theater was uh, the tests that we did 
uh, to try and get those linkups to work. And they're like, actually, you can't just do it in eight places. You have to do it for everybody who is involved. And then, and then as other things have come up, it's been a question of like, how do we translate those skills or those things that we've cultivated in other areas to be useful? And there's a lot of trial and error in it. Um, uh, one of the things that I, to 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 set things up a little bit, Logan, you touched on this uh, um, a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about our setups, or uh, like our setups, just to like introduce people to sort of where we're each coming from. Because I think we've got we're on uh, we're on of the four people here, we're uh, two of us are on one side and two of us on the other side of the Windows Mac <laughs> divide or lack of divide. I think that. Um, it's the right tool for the job. We may be using different types of software. We may be using a lot of common software as well. And connectivity. So um, in the work that you've been doing, can you give like a brief rundown of like what your configuration is for for uh, how, how you're doing streaming work from assuming from where you are right now? Um, I know that's where I'm doing it from. Mm -hmm. I'll go first. I'm on uh, I'm on a cable connection with Tech Safi that I had from before, uh, and it is inadequate to some of my needs because uh, not Tech Savvy's fault necessarily. I don't know, but uh, cable connections used like a shared bandwidth, and I've noticed with everybody working from home and everybody in virtual school that's gone really gone down. I'm working on a Mac because that's what I had before, and I haven't uh, spent the time building another computer or thinking about it since then, but that's what I had, and the work's got to get done. Um, I'm most of the time showing people to use OBS and uh, because that's what's free, but uh, also dip into other things as well. Um, you know, of the opinion that whatever you've got is the right thing to start with. Uh, uh, let's go. Uh, let's go back the other way around. Logan, what, what setup do you have? Because I feel like I'm going to start at the other end of the extreme. <laughs> yeah. So the my RTB setup, gives it away. Yeah. So I because my main streaming is through Twitch, um, and I am just like putting myself out there. I'm in my bedroom. It was how do I make this kind of a fun space? So uh, in terms of aesthetic things, um, I've just got some like fun. Like really cheap. This is one of the things I think a lot of people think getting into this stuff is like, I need to spend a lot of money. Oh no. And I was like, I bought $20 garden LEDs. Would I use this for a show in a theater? Probably not. Um, but in this case, they work great. They get the job done of making my grayish white walls look interesting. Um, for in terms of the, the, components um what i found the first thing i bought after the things that i owned was a better microphone um so i went right away to get uh an xlr mic with an audio interface because i noticed the first thing that people notice um once everything is up there is bad audio bad audio just like for me was instantly the thing that that grabbed me i was like i want to fix this thing in terms of my computer setup, I was just streaming. It's kind of in the back there now with stuff on it. Um, it was just the PC I had at the time. But um, a next big upgrade was like over the pandemic, I built another computer because I was noticing um, with the newer, because my main thing is for personal stuff is streaming mm -hmm. games, newer games running while sending the stream out uh, was starting to clog that up. Um, I gave up on the Macs uh, at the beginning of this year after my MacBook died, um, mostly because I, when looking at the price, it was for what I could get for my budget, I could build something quite stronger. Um, and then I another for my setup is I, I went away from the webcam um, mm -hmm. So I have a mirrorless Canon camera that's attached through uh, USB. Um, I also do like photography of, of miniatures and stuff. So it it's not something I would recommend people get unless you have another use for it. Uh, right. Eight hundred dollars for a webcam is not not a smart <laughs> investment in gear. Uh, oh, I would oh. say like 
yeah although all the the high-end ones like the high-end ones right now are going like for part of the pandemic early on we're already going for 800 bucks because there's such high demand for them i would say the webcam that i was streaming from i mean i bought it from a friend he sold it to me for 20 bucks a new version of that before the pandemic was probably 80 and it's now 120. yeah so yeah, I want to pull out a couple of things there just to highlight for those who are uh, watching and are new to this and don't know that um, a couple of things that I that I like to point out when someone's talking about getting involved with streaming performance, especially from the performer side of things, like what is the best thing to get content into that you're working with is all of the like the hi highlight all the things that you mentioned. Not that they have to spend a bunch of money on it, but that like if you're working off of somebody's laptop. Um, that like that small camera and the bezel of the laptop and the microphone that's sort of embedded in the keyboard someplace, they're intended for someone to be sitting in front of your computer at best. So they're not giving you great quality when you're in this configuration that we're in right now for whatever level of HD um, audio, et cetera, that you, that you have or don't have, that moving to anything external is a good first step if you want to up the quality, starting with a mic, I second starting with a mic, um, uh, uh, that that um, getting something that allows you to get a little bit of distance and a little bit of freedom of movement or a little bit like, is going to be positioned in such a way that's ideal for you not to be like sitting right up against everything mm -hmm. as though you're just in a meeting is going to, are, are the initial first steps to just having a better like even video conference experience as opposed to, uh, uh, over anything that's 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 on board. So I think that those are really useful things to point yeah. out. And yeah, I would say like for a performer, if you were wanting to take your like single person art that you were doing and put that onto the, a digital platform, um, like lighting is one of the things to look into. And that doesn't mean spend a lot. Um, Maybe I'll just move my camera. I have like over here, this LED panel. It does the job, came in a pack of three, and again was like, I think total 50 bucks. Yeah. Um, but it's like the difference, and I think this is the thing that intimidates a lot of people is like, oh, you see really high-end things done for the, like online, and you're like, oh, they've spent so much money on this, this setup. Um, but you kind of get like the, the difference between, you know, an $800 camera and a $1,000 camera for this. And even like a $1,500 camera for what, like I'm doing doesn't really provide a bang for the buck. And like lighting's the same, like companies like Elgato will sell well over a hundred dollar lights that can be programmed through your computer. Great. But this does the job and costs about 20 and is per like fixture and is you know all you need to start right you'll get so much from that like initial just small investment yeah frank uh continuing on that what i immediately start to think about is um something that we're both contributing to has been spending a lot of time on recently in which there are many performers what have uh both on your end of things in so far as uh receiving from a lot of performers and then optimizing how uh, how the content that you're then pulling together into a streaming performance sort of what's your setup yeah so i have a really uh interesting challenge and a different perspective from logan because i'm myself and not streaming I'm more facilitating video streams from other people, pulling them all in, manipulating them, and then spitting them out. So for example, I don't have a microphone. I don't, nobody hears me, so I, I didn't buy myself one. I didn't really buy myself a webcam either. I just have my, my laptop one. I'm also a Mac. Um, so I, I didn't really go heavy on the gear side of things other than uh, I just want to talk about the um, I have multiple computers because my computers, I, uh, to, to take in feeds, manipulate them, and spit them out again, it's so much processing power uh, required that I needed to split up the work between multiple computers. And the way that I'm passing signals between them is with uh, the Blackmagic A10 Mini Pro, which I highly recommend as a, a little bit of gear. Uh, it's a little it's a little pricey. I think the the 
the cheapest model is about four or five hundred dollars. Um, but basically, this thing can receive video feeds uh, from HDMI, and then it broadcasts. I'm actually not using it to broadcast. I'm just using it to basically shuffle feeds along. But it can broadcast directly with a bunch of effects and keying. Uh, it's a really great piece of gear that I've got. Okay. Um, and then from the, so here's another interesting challenge from when you're taking in other feeds is you can spend all your money on amazing cameras. And then at the end of the day, when it comes to me, I need to make it a certain size and resolution so that my system functions, <laughs> you know? So you can have, you can have the thousand dollar camera and still not look like a thousand dollar quality just because I'm managing six video feeds at the same time in real time. Like there's there's zero latency. I'm managing six feeds at a time, coming in, manipulating, spitting them out. And from me getting the feed till uh, the feed hitting OBS, it's like we're talking less than half a second. And then once you hit OBS, then another 15, 30 seconds is introduced and that's where your delays go. Um, so, uh, I, I just, I, I was really interesting listening to you, listening to you talk, Logan, because we come from very different perspectives of essentially doing more or less the same job. Just, I'm not personally on screen. I'm just kind of facilitating people across. Um, and so I kind of, as a, instead of hardware, I kind of devoted my time to software. Uh, and so right now I'm using a program called Live Lab by Culture Hub. Uh, Culture Hub is a New York City-based uh, performance company, and they developed this uh, tool that basically lets you take in multiple feeds and then spit them out to switchers. And then uh, those switchers, uh, so I can control who is in which switcher, and I'm basically screen capturing multiple switchers, sending them to a second computer uh, where it's getting input into Isadora, uh, I, I'm a huge Isadora fan. There are a couple different programs you could use to, to do this, but I'm using Isadora. Isadora is manipulating all of the video feeds and then spitting it out to OBS. Um, so there's a lot going on in, in a very little time. I focused all my efforts on minimizing latency because I found that when you get into too much latency, like if, if you're over a second in latency, it becomes impossible to work. People can't mm -hmm. talk to each other. They don't understand each other. Uh, you start to hear yourself or others. It gets really confusing. So what I've what I've kind of devoted my timelines on was how can I get as many feeds as possible to me in real time, and how can they all see what I'm doing in real time? Uh, and so Live Lab I found was the best for my purposes of just taking the feeds and spitting them out. And Isidore is also being pretty fast and pretty great about taking those real time feeds and spitting them out. Um, and then I'm, I, so it's interesting. I call them the two timelines. They're kind of like the two time zones. Uh, and so you have the actor time zone, which is real time as, as real time as you can get it because they need to talk to each other. They need to see what's going on. If they're reacting to something that's happening on screen, they need to see it and be able to, uh, know where to put their hand or their face or whatever. And then the second timeline is the audience timeline. And that is usually 15 to 30 seconds in the past. Uh, so keeping those two timelines separate and true to themselves as much as possible and that one's as real time as possible and the other one's gotta be 15 to 30 seconds just based on bandwidth and all the processing and yada yada. Yeah. Uh, but the two timelines, it's really important, uh, I found, to keep those separate and to make sure that people's don't, there's, their heads don't explode uh, <laughs> when they're trying to monitor what's going on in the show and because if you're trying to monitor what happened 15 seconds ago like you're going to be lost immediately i'm, uh, I'm laughing yeah. because um on on the current project in which you're doing this for um i'm also working on it and i'm doing front end for it so that like what is the audience experience so i know exactly what you're talking about because i need both up at the same time so i'm watching the live and then waiting for it to appear on another screen as it's embedded within a website to make sure those interactions are happening so I can see like the interface questions come down the line so that I can do edits there. Um, so the head exploding part is pretty much the story of my life. Uh, yeah, it's, no. 
yeah, it's a very similar thing for this symposium. Uh, yeah. In particular, when there's links that need to go out to the audience, I try to keep them in like audience timeline, but that but I still have to be engaged, obviously, with the streamers uh, to make sure the stream is going well and answer any questions there. So sometimes I'll have like, on <laughs> this is a little mental, but uh, I run all my audio through an internal switcher and I'll like put like one on one ear and one on the other ear. And it makes you feel like you're going insane. Uh, but then you're like, okay, that sentence has finally been said in audience time link can go in the chat because otherwise you know like the people who are watching at home are like wait so they're going to talk about this like i guess this is coming up it's like you don't want to give spoilers uh or distract at the wrong time yeah. but the like cognitive dissonance of having your brain like split with lag it's actually i think very similar to like when you're learning a new language and you're like translating in real time and you can like kind of understand it, but like you're always behind. Uh, I think it's a, it's a similar feeling. Yes. Oh, I know it so well right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, the, oh yeah, I mean, just like technology aside, the human brain is an amazing thing that is amazing at filtering out information because there'll be the two times and then the backstage like head calm chatter that's happening in this project over Discord. And then like there's the audio processing that's happening through clean feed. And they're not always, and then there's a Zoom meeting running at the same time. And it's like, where is somebody talking and when are they talking? And and oftentimes, there's been a couple of times where I've been like, I, there's a question, I need to say something to somebody, but I have no idea how to reach them or whether or not they said the thing that I'm reacting to 30 seconds ago or they just said it. Um, What's, what is your setup, Emily? How are you set up? You've been streaming for weeks now for this symposium in specific. Yes. So it's funny because I'm actually kind of in between Logan and Frank, particularly right now, uh, because we decided uh, a little last minute that instead of being behind the camera as I, uh, or like behind the screen as I always am for these symposium events, that I'd in fact be in front of the camera. So uh, we're not witnessing my full streaming setup uh, in its regular glory. So usually uh, if I were streaming and people were going to see my face, uh, I'd have like an HD wide angle webcam and a green screen uh, and then a few uh, panel lights. I think probably the same ones if Logan, if you got them on Amazon, uh, I think they're probably the same little <laughs> LED panel lights. They're great. They're cheap. They work. Uh, and then a USB mic uh, that's separate from my webcam and then a ring light uh, so that because when you have a green screen you really need to have like your actor light and then your green screen light otherwise you start to run into like shadows and messiness and you are the green screen and all that uh, garbage. Um, and then in terms of computer, uh, this is where it sort of veers a bit more towards Frank because my computer has been engineered to ingest a lot of feeds uh, and be able to do things with them uh, with great efficiency. So my streaming computer has a uh, Blackmagic capture card built into it. It's like a PCIe. And then I also have a like Thunderbolt card, which you can do uh, if your motherboard has a Thunderbolt header. So it can support per port uh, six daisy chain Thunderbolt devices. So depending on where you go for your uh, capture cards, uh, it can ingest like quite a few simultaneous live feeds. Uh, so if I'm working on a project in a theater, because our rules in Montreal, I'm from our conversation, I've realized are a little bit different than in Ontario. So we can still stream live performances from physical theatrical spaces, as long as there's no audience and we're all masked. Mm -hmm. So it's a computer that I would bring with me to a theater and then ingest all the feeds separately instead of ingesting them necessarily for like a splitter. Though I also am a big proponent of uh, the A10 mini uh, both for uh, both for streaming, but also for recording, like the new Pro ISO version, which is a little bit more expensive, can record for simultaneous feeds, which can be incredibly useful 
if you're recording something where you have like a multi-camera setup. Uh, and it means that you can also monitor them on good monitors while you're filming, which I think is a step that as theater, as theater performers have moved to the uh, recording and streaming world, the fact that like your eyes seeing reality is no longer the view you want to endorse. Like you want to look at a screen. You're in a space, too bad, look at the screen. Don't look at the stage. I don't care what's on the stage. I care what's on the screen. So uh, being able to monitor all those feeds, ideally on like if you can find them, color grading monitors, but any monitor is better than like seeing it in reality or like the tiny viewfinder on a camera. Right, right. How, how, uh, how have you found, aside like, what are, can you extend the description of the setup that you have, like us in Ontario, we are, we've had very minimal opportunity to do a lot of streaming from inside venues. They keep getting shut down and we keep getting moved around. Um, so having that experience is valuable. I know that I have, I've had the opportunity, like I've done some live streaming stuff of performance theatrical work pre pandemic. Um, and to talk about that setup, but usually that like involves a bigger setup than maybe we do. What is the what have been the setups that you've been seeing in, in streaming that sort of in theater type of work? Yeah, so I mean like ideally uh multi-camera. I don't think anything good comes out of like a single camera stream. It just feels like an archival. Uh and uh no one wants to watch an archival. I feel like I've been saying this for a year now. Mm -hmm. Uh but so ideally having two to three cameras with camera operators so that they can either uh, move around or you can set those positions uh, beforehand. And then uh, running those all to something like an, like an ATEM Mini or uh, the Ultra Studios are really great because they're like mm. super lightweight. Uh, they're pretty cheap. I think it's like 150 bucks per Ultra Studio. And like it has one job, which right. is ingest HDMI. And it does that job tremendously well. So uh, a few cameras with some form of capture card. And then um, it depends then what's happening to it, right? Like I've been working on a lot of shows where uh, we've been filming and then like manipulating uh, the footage in some way. So, you know, there's like layers being added or it's being augmented. Uh, so those would usually run through a separate computer because as Frank mentioned, when you have a lot of feeds coming in, um, you just, you just can't. It's like the concept of shooting in 4k, you know, like that's great, but are the people watching it going to have 4k monitors and can your computer handle that many 4k feeds? And mm -hmm. like, do you have any of the rest of the infrastructure beyond like the camera that says 4k? <laughs> um, and then, Oh, oh networked everything like hardline, mm -hmm. uh, no Wi-Fi anywhere in sight. And then it's really <laughs> Frank's nodding. <laughs> Uh, and then ideally, uh, I would stream through an ATEM as well. You could yeah. you could stream directly out of a computer, but uh, the ATEMs are great in the way that you can like put your RMTP feeds uh, directly into like an XML XML file. And for those of you who don't know what those letters mean, uh, it's basically when you're streaming to an address, you uh, give wherever you're streaming from a code and a stream key, and it just tells the destination. Uh, so streaming through an ATEM is really, really painless, I would say. It's yeah. like the easy, low barrier of entry. Yeah, it's nice to offboard as many processes as you can, because you're asking, and in all situations, like in, in my experience with uh, a, di a distance performers with like six performers coming in, um, we ended up using, you know, so different vi vi different video platforms that people can use for it. Uh, Frank, you mentioned Live Lab. Um, a lot of people are using Zoom. Zoom has its limitations into bringing into broadcast software because it doesn't output um, like video transfer standards. You have to sort of do a window capture with it. Uh, uh, I've done a bunch of work now with where we've tried to where we've been taking advantage of Skype and its ability to, its integration of NDI, so that you can take discrete mm -hmm. feeds 
Skype for no really good reason in my mind is really resource intensive compared to like Zoom and other video conferencing platforms. But if you get the power for it, at least then you have the isolated uh, feed that goes along with it. But then you're like, you're running um, whatever your video switcher software, your virtual video switcher. A lot of us uh, have mentioned OBS and whatever your video conferencing platform is and you're streaming out. So you're taking in a, a lot and you know even even on this computer, which uh, if, if people haven't picked up uh, a lot of the streaming stuff, especially because it's related to gaming, I found is um, optimized for a Windows environment because there's more users there that have been using it to stream games. So especially something like OBS and pieces of the streaming software. Um, but once you start running all of those and then you're like, and we'd like to monitor it in whatever video platform we're having, sending it back to that, you're just like, all right, I need to, need to pull out another computer because like you're asking a lot of any machine to do that. Even when you start mm. topping out, the fans start to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stream yes. goes burr. <laughs> Stream goes burr. Uh, telling, we're topical. Yeah. <laughs> I um, told my, my team yesterday that my computer is plugged into power and at the end of the day is still around 55%. Yeah, like that's it's, that's how hard it's working. Is it man. the charge? Is it fast enough to keep it going? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so like, yeah, if you can push any of those steps, like the encoding of your stream off onto a piece of hardware, where like that's what it's been engineered to do, then I I would recommend that. I'm just gonna throw in one question that just came in yeah. because I was talking, which was like, what cameras have I been using? Yes, I want to uh, answer that one. <laughs> Uh, so I've had pretty, this is like more personal preference than anything else, but I really like Sony's line of mirrorless cameras, like the uh, A4000 and A6000. They have like a good range of lenses that you can get. Uh, they're small, they're lightweight. They can shoot in 4K if that's your jam, though I wouldn't stream that way. I would just shoot that if, if that's a thing that you want. Um, but then you have to edit 4K, which is like, we go back to computer go brr. Oh, uh, <laughs> as someone who works a lot in 360 video, like, join me over in the 8K land. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, no thank you. Um, yeah, it's a lot. But yeah, I, I really like the, like the Sony 6000, A6000 is, is a great little camera. They're like pretty small, pretty portable great content yeah in a, in a in this previous the pre-pandemic life where we were set a bunch of the stuff that i was working with would work with panasonic cameras but we were mm -hmm. working with like uh broadcast cameras like it was mm -hmm. so it's like the like currently there's um how many of the two models reversed but panasonic that like the ag and then some sequence of letters um mm -hmm. Uh, the main difference between like they'll do up to 4K, but they've got um, and uh, we were going SDI, and so, so we could run it longer into some switcher. Like most of the switchers, you can get SDI if you so you're not running long HDMI, um, mainly so you don't kick it out really. Than anything else like HDI, uh, the fact that HDMI is not a locking connector drives me crazy. Um, uh, but so you could go at SDI, and it could also the like the newer ones have NDI built into it. So then you can use anything that uses a network device interface to talk between things. But it's how a lot of in, like things become interoperable when you're doing uh, like digital video transport locally. You don't have to. Um, it's a nice, it's a nice thing to have. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great feature. Um, yeah. I will say as well though for the Sony ones is that they're yeah. like under a thousand dollars. That's a big difference. That's a big difference <laughs> between the cameras. I'm uh, I, I and the Canons are nice because they have the USB, like a bunch of the Canon cameras have the USB webcam feature built into them. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like you know whatever, all of these will get the job done, and it's like ease of setup you're you you're like how accustomed you are to the software and, and andrew says that they're more like twelve hundred dollars oh like well Maybe they're under the thousand dollars us yeah the a4000 are a little bit cheaper than the 6000 but also i could be completely wrong on that um 
in terms of not being quite a thousand dollars. Uh, I mean, like if you wanted to go fancier as well, like you could just go all in on black magic. Uh, right. And then if you have a like an ATEM, you can actually do all your camera control directly in the switcher software. You can uh, right. manipulate all of those settings because they're made to talk to each other, but they are going to run like a hefty chunk more than getting something that's not black magic. Right. Well, let's talk about software for a second. The question came up and I was actually rather pointed. It's like, why choose OBS over anything else? <laughs> I like this question. Yeah, uh, there's a there's awesome. a, there's two versions of this answer. There's the there's the complicated <laughs> version. And there's the really uncomplicated version. Who wants to say the uncomplicated version? I bet we would all say the same thing. Go for it, Frank. It's free and easy. That that's my <laughs> <laughs> that's my reason. <laughs> yes, it's open source. Uh, <laughs> it has a good support community to it. There's lots of plugins to extend it. It's like, I like doing things with NDI. NDI is not built into it. You get a plugin. It does stuff with NDI in and out for sending things as well. They've um, And they've been developing it rapidly recently. So it's like the virtual camera used to be a plugin, and now it's just built into the, the last couple of builds, I think. Um, Which, for example, just to cut in for a sec, yeah, yeah, no, that's how we have our subtitles is OBS and the right. virtual camera. Um, because uh, it can, it's it's open source and it's free uh, and it's it's a great way of yeah connecting things and like I exactly what you're saying Ian, there's like so many plugins um, that are just constantly being developed. This is also one of the areas where uh, like Windows has the advantage too because it like the community that's developing it is like like the primary the largest user base larger than us doing streaming theatrical performance around <laughs> gaming it tends to be pc oriented there's things like there's a plugin that i want someone to port over to the mac version of it that involves um motion graphics like mm -hmm. being able to animate uh like do tr like just translation of graphics from one place to another in transitions I mean, you currently can't do that on mac but you can do it on pc um, the Mac version of it can't access your system audio. You have to sort of do a hack around that. Um, I use VB cable. I don't know, Frank, you use something else uh, to get audio into OBS. Uh, yeah, the audio is coming in through a program called Audio, audio Movers. OK, and, great. Um, and Audio Movers is basically, so our sound designer can send his DAW directly to me through a link in real time at extremely high quality. And then I'm able to plug that into Loopback, which is this awesome audio routing software. Uh, and Loopback then goes into OBS and, and pushes it forward into the stream. But Audio Movers, if you're looking to route sound in real time and high quality, I highly recommend looking into Audio Movers. Yeah. And if you're stuck on the, uh, if you're on, because on PC, you can just capture the your system sound if you want. But if you need to do that on Mac, I use uh, VB, VB Audio does a couple of different virtual patch plugins where it creates a virtual input and a virtual output that you can match together to rewrite your audio. It's not the slickest thing in the world, but it gets the job done. Um, like I use that even though I'm on PC. Um, yeah. To have different sources mm -hmm. at different levels and being able to like individually send things to myself and to OBS. Uh, mm -hmm. So I use a mix of VB cables and voice meter yeah yeah i use voice meter potato uh which is the highest tier of voice meter uh it's so cheap why not yeah <laughs> it's like five bucks to donate it's donationware which also yeah. i think relating to obs like the open like the spirit of being open uh i really like when i find that in a program mm -hmm. uh but voice reader potato is great. Like I, I use it just to mix my like daily life as well. Like I'll be like, I want this like YouTube link a little bit lower, undergoing my Zoom call, and then there's like fire just out of my left ear. Um, right. So like aside from like professionally, it's just if you want a lot of control or like any control over the audio on your computer, yeah. run everything through a, a virtual sound interface. 
I've been recently been doing OBS workshops. And so it's like, as you mentioned, just to like explain what we're talking about when it's like why this is available. So each of us is capturing our camera or our video source via OBS. And then we've like uh, capturing through a web captioner. We're capturing the like, real time that has access to our mic, real time captions that we're then composing those things together. Um, in, in different ways, so it's like I just I'm just turning over. This is my oh. <laughs> this, is, this is the same OBS show that I have running right now. No, it's not actually the end. No, I don't want to put that up. <laughs> I'm trying to find the right one that has like all the uh, added to it. Nope. While Ian is going yeah, through his right. OBS show, if anyone in the audience does want more information on how to do this, we have been sending out to people who email us at levelup.designers.ca. We have a little tutorial that we send to our presenters so that they can get set up. So if you as an audience member want to know how to do this, we are more than happy. If you send us an email, we'll send you our PDF uh, and then you can add captions into your feed. Yeah. But back to your fantastic OBS show, Ian. Uh, like, I, I forgot that I put like end at the end of it when we were putting it together. Um, <laughs> It was like this whole visualization thing, which like it's not working right now because I moved a bunch of the content around. The other nice thing about OBS, I mean, it works for most programs too, is that you would um, you can move the shows around. Essentially, it's creating a JSON, it's creating a JavaScript file that's just like all the instructions. So as long as it knows where the the stuff is, it will pull it in. Um, the um, you know there are other programs. I've I've dabble a bit in Livestream Studio just because um, for our work. Uh, that we do at Toaster Lab, we have a premium Vimeo account, so we have it. And the nice thing about it, and really the main difference between it and OBS, is that it's got a bunch of transitions and stuff built into it. Like in OBS, you can you've got all your inputs, and it's up to you to figure out how to make stingers and graphics and lower thirds and all of those things. Like you can build all those things. So if you got that skill and you got that time, it's um, free, right? You can do all of that. Um, the paid versions of it slightly can be slightly slicker, just because uh, maybe somebody put spent a little bit more time paying somebody to do uh, some design around the interface. But they've got like transitions built in uh, and stingers and uh, some effects built in, just to like, sort of extend it. Also, the live stream one, um, live stream and Vimeo are the same company. Uh, so if you're using Livestream Studio and you just like log into your Vimeo account, you don't have to worry about like it will do. You can same as as you were saying like if you're using all Black Magic, then it talks to itself really well. If you're using Livestream Studio, um, it talks to Vimeo if that's what you're using as your as your platform really well. Um, though saying really well versus like, I got to get a stream key and put it into the field where I put the stream key <laughs> is as difficult as it gets with an OBS in so far. Yeah. They've got all the ingest servers like preloaded into there as well. Yeah. Um, I do want to say one other thing about yeah. why to use OBS over, why I'm using OBS over the A10 mini because originally I was going to stream out of the A10 mini. Yeah. Uh, and we realized that the A10 mini can't delay audio. And so we're receiving audio oh, no. and trying to match it back up with the video. And mm -hmm. I needed the control of delaying audio and video uh, independently to match them. Mm -hmm. And I could only get, uh, I don't know if it does any delay, but one of them was missing. And so I had to go back into OBS and OBS does a really great job of efficiently delaying video and audio. Right, so you uh, couldn't retime it. Other, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the way that we got around that is we actually, like we output everything as uh, HDMI just into an ATEM for that like last step of streaming. So all of our delays uh, were like all calibrated already on our end. Uh, yeah, I'm receiving time. the feed through loopback and, and audio movers. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I had no, if you're with your sound person, awesome. <laughs> but if your sound person is in another city, can't use the ATEM. Right. Um, on the subject of getting things out, where are you sending things to? Where are you landing your feeds um, when you are sending things out? There's a lot of different options out there. We, we, I think Twitch has come up a couple of times because it's where a lot of, like, it's known for streaming. Um, where else are you sending things? Oh, there's a question. I mean, YouTube is, like, I think the next most common one that I end up sending things to. Um, 
or often doing something like restream to go to like a lot of the conferences that I've worked on. Um, it's been like, oh, this needs to go to seven presenters, Facebook pages and one presenters, YouTube and someone else's Twitch. And it's like, okay, we'll just send it to restream. That'll get it all. Um, mm -hmm. What I do like about YouTube is that like, here is a link to it afterwards. Um, whereas like Twitch will only save the video for um, until you're like partnered with them uh, for a couple days. Right. You get like about a week if you're in like the middle tier for them, which, you know, a lot of, especially as uh, like working with theater companies, like they're not going to spend the time doing a bunch of streams to get to that point. They're like, we have a show in a few weeks. We don't want people to see it until then. Um, so yeah, I think like YouTube has been been a really solid one. A lot of the theater shows, like the ones that I did with York University, the show that I just did with TPM, uh, those were where it ended up going to. Yeah, and they make it pretty easy. The big limitation is that you've got to request. Like if you're just going to get started, you know, it takes 24 mm -hmm. hours to get the, yeah, the yes. streaming capability turned on. Uh, are there um, other ones that you're going to, Emily? For this, we're mainly just going to uh, Vimeo uh, because that's where like HowlRound is, and then they're sort of distributing from there. Um, but one of the questions, part of that question, was about the ability to monetize. Mm. Uh, and what I would say around that is that it's probably easier to monetize the access to your stream, which is to say, like, sell tickets. Um, and have the link up like privately don't publicize it like like selling the access to get to your event um then leaves you a bit more open in terms of like does the streaming service you're looking at actually have like all the other um streaming capabilities that you want and you're not paying necessarily a premium for services that allow you to monetize because there's lots of ways that you can sell tickets online. We're using a platform called Tito, uh, which is pretty cool uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way that it uh, doesn't charge for uh, sh tickets that are free um, mm -hmm. because a lot of platforms uh, charge uh, a fee even if you're doing like an event that's not for profit, right. uh, which ours is. Um, but yeah, one of the cool things with uh, StreamYard actually, which is the format that we're talking to you today, is very similar to Restream. You can like broadcast to multiple different uh, destinations simultaneously. So if we did want this to go out to like five YouTube pages uh, and a Facebook and a Twitch, we could do that all within StreamYard versus having to send it to Restream. Yeah. Uh, but Restream also does have its own broadcast studio. There's like so many different places that you can you can go down that tunnel. Yeah, the one service that has been recommended, I haven't spent much time with it, but the one service that um, someone pointed me to is like, if you want to monetize the actual stream, aside from like the Twitch method of doing it, but another way that's good for doing it is dlive.tv. I don't know if anybody has any experience with it, but no. I just have it on a list of like, here's a streaming service that you could do to monetize the stream itself. But I think within theater, and I feel like you were just alluding to this, Emily, that like a lot of like the commercialization and monetization on the streaming side of things, we don't work at a scale at which that's particularly viable. It's not like we're going to get a million views on our stream. Like it takes a while. To, even if we're doing the most amazing shows ever, like that would still take like investment of time. You'd have to want to be like theater on Twitch. Um, to like really invest in cultivating that as opposed to like, I need a place to put it out. Um, we we use Vimeo, the project Frank and I are using on, are using technically three Vimeo accounts um, split between three different organizations because we have seven streams involved in a, in a production running concurrently. And one of the limited, so YouTube, I don't know if there's an upward limit on the number of streams you can do concurrently. I've not tried or looked into it very hard. I know with Vimeo, um, slash live stream, they do like with their premium, uh, their premium, which is their largest 
account that they publish a price for. Otherwise, you have to go over to Enterprise. Um, they do three. You can do unlimited streaming, but you can only run three at a time. Uh, but they'll do it immediately. You can white label it, so you take off all the branding and all of that that goes along with our wife events. But it costs money; like you're paying them to take it off. And they'll also redo the the like. They'll link it. They have some of the restream will do like every RTMP thing, um, and you can always customize it too. But Vimeo is willing to send it to wherever you want, um, as well. Uh, the show that Frank and I are working on right now. Um, which I guess I could say it. This is not really a plug, but it's kind of a plug. Yeah. plug it. That's we're fine. It. We're working on a, a production of Orestes that's meant for streaming. It's not just a streaming performance, but it is like built within a streaming world. Um, like part of it is that we're, uh, the Toaster Lab port is side of it, the part that I'm involved in, Frank's doing all of the video, um, is um, we're building um, uh, a custom web interface for it. So that you have to go through, like you can't get to the videos without going through the website, and it's all password protected. So, like the way that the ticketing is being run for for that is that you then receive a link and you have access to it on just the day of the performance, and it's a custom platform. And then the next day you wouldn't be able to access it without having new credentials for each performance yep. um, of it moving forward. I haven't, yeah, I haven't seen other too many other distribution platforms. Frank, what were you just? Oh, well, I was just gonna say. So I send my streams to you and Garrett. And, yeah, <laughs> I take and, all your streams. <laughs> and I, I just want to say, um, you know, one of our very first conversations when we were dreaming up the world of of Orestes was we didn't want to use a service like YouTube or Zoom or or your average streaming service. So we decided we wanted our own website. And I think what I want to say is make your own websites. It's actually not that hard just to have a page playing a video. It can get super hard uh, if you want to be more complicated than that. But if all you're doing is building a, a landing page with an embedded video, uh, you can do it. It's not that hard. And you'll get a, a custom look out of it, a custom show, something that's different and that maybe um, people won't expect. Uh, I think that ultimately you're going to have to use something like a YouTube or a Vimeo or, or whatever to, to play that embedding. But if if the question is how, like what other ways can I get my shows across without being in a Zoom or a YouTube, build your own web page, embed your, embed your, embed your videos. It'll look so cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, and that's, sorry, Ian. Um, no, go. go. I was going to say, that's the route that we, we went with uh, Level Up, is the, the links that people get when they sign up is to our website, and also then that's where our archives end up to try and keep things really clear and clean, because we're not charging, and we do want this to be publicly available um, for a significant period of time. So keeping everything in one place was where we wanted to go. And there, it is still streaming to HowlRound and on Facebook, and like I can look at the analytics for those, but they generally on most of our um, most of our streams are about eighty to eighty five percent of people are accessing it through the website. So you're still we're still getting some incidental viewers who might be on Facebook and see something, but those engagements aren't as long as on the website. Mm -hmm. um, and it it creates like a a more polished experience, I would say. Uh, if you're really tech technically inclined, you can actually build your own RMTP server using the like Google Cloud server systems or AWS, depending on what you're like more familiar with. But it's like not a trip for the foolhardy down. Yeah. <laughs> we, um, one of, a, one of the, there's three people who are sort of like the the, that um, make up like the core of uh, Toaster Lab. And um, Andrew uh, uh, Simpri, who is in Toaster Lab, as opposed to uh, uh, Andrew Trevor, who's introduced us earlier today. Multiple Andrews, lots of people named Andrew out there in the world. I don't know if you know this. But um, <laughs> anyway, he is, uh, he does a lot of the technical. And one of his projects in pandemic was like running a pirate radio station, um, but a pirate stream. 
And so he didn't want to send it out to, I, I hope that this doesn't send anybody after him. Um, but like, <laughs> like to get around, uh, to get around like licensing issues and not worry about it and just do it. Like he's like, no one's ever going to like, I don't know who's going to see it. I just want to send a link to friends, but I want to play whatever I want and not get into any sort of things. He's like, he does, and he, but he is, he is definitely on the high, uh, he is a high end developer. He's like, really, the RTMP, like to rebuild Twitch mm -hmm. without all the Twitch around it is like 60 lines of code. It's not actually mm -hmm. a lot of code to do that. He's like, the hard part is managing all the data that comes across, like to be able to transport the data. Um, because you, you need that high speed connection, uh, to do things, and then that data has to go someplace for someone else to access it, and so you have to have up and down like space to be able to put it in. But yeah, you could build your own custom RTMP solution. It's not that hard. It could get pricey though. Um, yeah, that's the thing. Like it was something I looked into briefly for this symposium, and I was like, Emily, you're focusing your attention in the wrong place. <laughs> like we need to finish getting guests. You don't need to be building a custom server just because you think it'd be fun. Right. Um, uh, cause <laughs> you like also, <laughs> you also will definitely like run into like, is this worth it financially? Once you're, mm -hmm. once you're figuring out the amount of, of data, like there's a reason that you pay for other streaming services, you know, like yeah. they have servers that they need to pay for. And if you do it, you will also have servers that you need to pay for. But if you think it's fun, like I do, uh, then give it a shot and put it on your own website. I'd say that about the, the website side of things. Like we've been we've been developing this website for the show to get like custom ways of like the audience going through things, and there's like a branching narrative. We want to do the wrap around it. I wouldn't say it's particularly like uh, it, it's it's like nice that it contains the show. The focus is very much on the show content. Um, and some added features to it. And it's like, there are things that uh, you can go through and you can click on. So like we put the time into like, where can we create clickable areas? So something comes into the video. Now you know that you can click on something and it takes you to different parts. So it's got some, some like small digital immersion types of engagement uh, for it. Um, uh, but it's really not that like getting started with doing that. Because that's also part of the sonography, right? This is a design conversation. Like there is the video itself and there's designing that, but then there's also like, it, it's like if you like didn't think about what the theater looked like when you walked into it. There's I'm gonna leave all the lights on and it's actually a McDonald's play place, but I'm still <laughs> gonna do, I'm just gonna have, I'm gonna have, it's gonna be under a freeway over at, I mean, unless that, but like you'd put it there because you'd want it to, but like, I'm going to do a production of Death of a Salesman and I'm going to put it in the McDonald's Play Place. Unless that's your concept. <laughs> I'm like, like I watched that show. I, know, <laughs> I, was like, I can't think of an example that someone would want to see at some level. But um, you want to think about what the surrounding area and what the surrounding user experience is of it as well, because we do that anytime anyway. So the downside to, to YouTube is that you then get surrounded by the YouTube junk and Twitch, less like the Twitch thing, unless you invest some time in doing it. Um, and like, it's so easy to just go and embed it someplace else. Um, and, and like, even if it's a blank page, so to rid of all the distractions and the ads and everything like that. Um, um, yeah, you're gonna go to, <laughs> I know where you're gonna go and I want you to go there, do it. Uh, so I was gonna say, speaking of engagement, uh, this great question <laughs> came in, which is uh, one challenge I find when creating live digital content is the lack of engagement. Have you found any tools or strategies beyond a live chat, so no one can take that one, uh, to engage your digital audiences? Can I say that we put performers in a live chat? Like we put people into the yeah. chat? Yeah, and that's one thing that, that we've been doing. We've yet to have the performer on Orestes. They've yet to do it, but it's there. The functionality is built into it. So it's on yeah, yeah and that's... The... Sorry, go ahead, Logan. <laughs> I was going to say, the, uh, the the York shows, the, the performers, at least from Hags, um, would go into the chat when points that they weren't on, on video. Um, and... Way to dodge those spoilers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like uh, um, when they weren't weren't in a scene, they'd go in and engage with it, which I think creates a whole new dynamic that you can't have with, or cannot easily have with traditional theater. Um, but in terms of non 
live chat ways of getting engagement um it's tough uh the the big things are like that i find are make interesting content somewhere else that makes people hyped about your show like talking from a twitch perspective um live streaming you're not going to get engagement just from live streaming something so like at least theaters have their pre-existing subscribers and people that are interested in that but if you're trying to get new people um you know i know again going back to to york there would always be like instagram stories like instagram is great a minute uh video on instagram uh it's like longevity in terms of engagement with an audience is about 90 minutes twitter has an engagement about of about like when you post something five to 15 minutes after that unless you have something blow up um facebook and youtube of course much like longer lasting things but it's that look at social media uh is the big one and like you know maybe this is just me as someone who like spends a lot of time on social media i find most theater social media really boring like looking at big theater companies it's like i'm not i'm engaged with you because i am a theater person who is already part of this community but you know i think if you're going to especially entering a digital platform and a world that already has people involved with it like there are people who consume digital content you know reach out to those people and that is like post three instagram posts mm -hmm. a week post four twitter posts a week have you know people who feel comfortable maybe performers um or designers share bits either like funny things or whatever level of like you know pre work thing that you feel comfortable sharing because i get you want to hide as much but it's uh yeah that big engagement comes from from social media in in this this setting and um yeah my big ones are instagram twitter um can i toss uh, in there too sure um or just to 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 um add to that uh is um uh, all of those things, like if you start thinking about there's, um, uh, I don't want to dig it up, but there's like a slide when I've been talking about people uh, talking, doing workshops around, it's primarily like technical around like getting used to OBS and setting that up and things like that. But there tend to be designers. And so that there's um, like thinking about all those engagement channels as part of the show. Like this is no longer like the show isn't just what you're seeing on screen. It's like going back to that idea, what you said earlier, Emily, is that like the single camera is an archival shot. Um, like we're seeing one view here. And if we think about now, the site isn't just our screen. Um, and then you can have the chat engagement. The, the thing you're starting to think about like what's the extended site of it's like, it's an online show, it's an online theatrical presentation, that there are ways of engaging, extending the idea of what you have um, so that you're engaging people and in as many channels as you can and trying to build that in. Now that's not easy to do, especially in the frameworks that we have. Um, and uh, there's like, whether or not you get to the true thing, um, a, a friend and collaborator, Jacob Needs Vicky, like, uh, like, I like his turn of phrase, that it's like, we've lost the ability in the last year for the audience to ruin the show. Like, the, like that aspect of the social contract. So I like, that's one of the areas that I'm super interested in. One of the things that we were exploring with the Orestes website that I don't think anybody bought into but me was the um, having like, you can use um, web RTC, web real-time chat, um, and implement that. And it works for chat, but it's like how Discord does its voice transmission too. You can build it into the website. We're using it right now. Like it's part of the back end here um, that if you built it into a show so that you could like ask the audience to turn their mics on so that you could hear them react in real time. It's tricky because they'd be reacting to the stream. This gets back to the two time zones. <laughs> It's a little brain breaky to do it, but like, so you could start to interact with people. Or if you break things out into Zoom or different interactive elements, there's a there's a show that um, uh, students at York are developing right now that has a lot of gaming elements to it, and you like interact with it through Zoom, but then it like will send you to 
like a website where you play games together and that's how you progress the show is that like it you can do the stream but then you have other places that people go to to interact with you so they feel like they're part of what's moving forward so it's not you can't it, all of those get down to you can't just rely upon the video for the engagement and that hopefully people will talk about it you have to go and engage them in some way yeah and it's it's also about you know i think that this for for any design element but it comes back to like the dramaturgy of it right like it's figuring out how you want to engage with people why you want to engage with people and at what points with what methods so you know like it even if you're going to be like throwing people into like a game or asking people to turn on their mics or like whatever all of these options are because there are a lot of like interesting ways to like grab the people through their computers um you need to still be thinking about uh like why are we doing this and how does that integrate to the story and how does that make sense dramaturgically mm -hmm. um i was very fortunate to see a piece or experience a piece in the early pandemic that was done by um michelle cutler and i i, I don't remember the rest of her team uh but it was primarily audio based, but also had some like text elements. And so the audience was super limited. And then there'd be points in this story where you would be like asked to type things back. And then those would get integrated into the rest of the narrative. Uh, and you'd see everyone's responses. And, you know, there was a little bit about like calmness versus anxiety and like uh, those sort of tensions is like, I would, I would say like, quintessentially early pandemic art uh in like the best way possible like how, mm -hmm. how to make you feel calm at home and so like one of the questions was like describe like a place that's comforting and so your res people would just be like typing all these responses and then they would sort of come in layered but the speed that they would come in was like very slow at first and then would build up so it really did feel like you're like being enveloped by like all this like warmth and comfort from these people that you, you didn't know, you couldn't see them, you didn't know their names. Um, but it was it was very engaging, but made sense in terms of like where in the story it was inserted, how it was inserted, how it related to like the rest of the the piece. So it's it's really important to keep that dramaturgy in mind when mm -hmm. approaching this concept of engagement. I just want to say I think it's a really awesome question because it really gets to the core of uh, live digital performance. And I think that um, engagement is participation and participation um, reinforces that this is happening live. Mm -hmm. And if there's no engagement or participation, how are you proving to people that what you are doing live is live? And if there's no proof that it's live, why are you doing it live? You will save yourself so many headaches and so many <laughs> sleepless nights if you don't do it live. So you need to have a reason to be doing it live. And that goes into what Emily was saying of the dramaturgy of the piece. Um, but I, I have spent the greater part of the last year using this question of engagement of online audiences. Yeah. Uh, because I think it's so important to live digital creation. And if you're going to be live, have a reason to be live. Uh, and because there are only two ways to prove that you're live. At least that I've found. There may be more, but there's two ways that I found, and that's participation or failure. Those are the only ways. To <laughs> no, it's it's 100 yeah. percent correct. When uh, like uh, in June we did a dance performance, and it was like uh, six performers. This is the one with NEI. Six performers. They're like in three different countries. Somebody was coming in from New Zealand. Everybody was in a different city. Everybody got a green screen. We figured out all the things. They composed all these things together, put it up online. Every single time we rehearsed it, something went wrong. Somebody's connection dropped out. Somebody's resolution dropped. Like something happened uh, with it going forward. The first time it all ran let's go with flawlessly. I'm going to put that in scare quotes, but the flawlessly like as intended and designed was the, like the, we only did one public performance of it. And, uh, and at the end of it, I was just sort of like, Oh, why didn't we just record that? <laughs> because like, it was just too slick it was too slick for what was going on. There was one point at which we had integrated like, uh, and we just ran out of time to implement it, but we were going to put a Facebook chat group that we had um, 
curated and use an OBS window capture to like have it uh, superimposed so that people could like share in parts of the show. And it was designed in such a way that like the content, it didn't really matter if it was synchronous. Like we cut it out before it would like, so it'd still be relevant in the feed for when people were participating. And we we're doing it as a Facebook chat because you could create a group and then you could control who was in it so that it wasn't just like a bunch of random people sending things or a hashtag or something like that. Um, and we ended up cutting it just because we like, we didn't have, nobody had the energy to wrangle the group together. But I was like, I really missed it when we got to the end. It was like, oh, that ran really well. Really did it matter that we did it live? Yeah. I mean, it's like uh, it's like interactivity in any form, right? Like when things get pitched in a traditional theatrical setup and you're like, oh, can make it interactive and you're like, okay, well, we could like spend hours programming this in touch designer and put these sensors strapped to the actor and tech it for 15 hours and it's going to be yeah. great. But will anyone notice if the stage manager just hits a button at the yeah. right time and it happens, right? Yeah. So like sometimes that interactivity is like needed and, and impactful and like truly does need to be interactive. And sometimes it just needs to feel interactive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, I think the same thing applies here. If, does it actually need to be live or could you record and edit a really like slick version of your show and release it, right? Like what are those tensions there? What are you looking for in terms of your, your output? Because if you don't actually need to or want to engage with your audience in a live way, like what Frank was saying, you're gonna get a thousand percent better product in terms of reliability and control if you do it beforehand. Yeah. Um, two, two things that I would encourage people to do to, uh, to enhance that. Um, and I think that it's been, a, uh, we've danced around it, like make sure you hit the capacity to do those things too. Like if you like have a person to do those things, you can't have a video designer slash streaming, that's already two jobs, um, if not more. And then also do, and then also have that same person be like, no, I'm gonna design all these interaction points for it. You need someone to be thinking through that. Um, it's a slightly different skill set to talk about what is a linear progression of a set of cues versus what is user interface and what is interactive and what happens, what confirms, like what what does the user experience? I'll, I'll use a case study that we were, we haven't solved, but it came up in notes last night, um, is that there's a point in the show, Frank knows what I'm talking about. Uh, there's a point in the show where you can like select a couple of different things. And one of them is to stay where you are but if you you can cl uh, and so there's different things that you can click on, and they're trying to talk about like, well, what happens if you click stay? We're like, well, if you you stay, it's like, but then nothing happens. So do you know that anything happened? And if you don't know that something <laughs> happened, and you try and click it again, you're going to end up stopping the video because you've now clicked the stay thing and you've gone to a different place and you don't know it. So it's like, what happens to acknowledge those things? And so you sort of need. Just as what, why we bring in different areas of expertise. There's new levels here. It's like your streaming person could be a completely different thing. There's design and technical elements of that too. Wherever you're landing that feed and someone's going to be observing it, designing that experience and having them work together as a team where it's like, who's creating the buttons? Who's creating the graphics? Are they in the video? Are they over the video? Is it the surrounding experience? Um, are things like uh, bring people in to do that that have... Uh, the expertise, or at least the bandwidth, both literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. That's why I dropped out for a second there, because <laughs> my internet connection has been questionable. I've been tethering to my phone, and I just hit my data cap for it renews tomorrow. I made it to the end of the month. See, we're live. This I is know. a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I dropped out because I had to turn to a phone to make this session work today. Well, I'm thinking, we had uh, interaction and we had failure. Both of them are keys to being live. <laughs> but I, I'll put this question out to the to the to the audience, the at home audience, is that we've been trying really. We we're we're getting we're getting the questions in. Is like, does this feel interactive? Um, I'm sure we'll see later when we see a transcript of it. Yeah. Uh, what's happening? Out. But I I would be curious to the audience here. Like, do you feel 
like you have th that you're engaged with us because we are acknowledging, integrating, asking the specific questions, or getting integrated into the graphics. Like this is this is also why Emily is like you should be part of this because there's this meta conversation of we are doing a live performing of talking about performance. Does it feel <laughs> engaging? How are you engaging? Do you like this experience? Um, this is this is the same type of experience that we're talking about, uh, perhaps with fewer computers involved, because we're just, mm -hmm. us talking. It's a simpler setup. It is. Uh, speaking of engagement, there's a few questions, just be oh, yeah. cognizant of time, that we haven't gone to. So uh, I'm going to throw up, uh, do you have any setups to help with eye lines when you are talking to someone through a lens and may not be able to also see their reactions? Little LED above the camera. Um, like a tally light sort of thing? Yeah, just something really small that won't get on them, but that, especially if you're doing it in, let's say, a theater where they're dark, mm -hmm. uh, but like something where they can see, this is where I need to look. Yeah. I yeah, mean, that's, that's a great one. There. Um, if you're, uh, you know, that's why they position you where you are where you are in Zoom. They, they always put you towards the top center in the grid view, so because we're vain and we look at ourselves <laughs> to pull your eyes up to the camera so that it looks like you're looking at the person you're talking to. Um, um, I was going to say, sometimes... Things, yeah. oh, oh, Frank. Say what you are your... You need an external webcam and an external monitor. Mm -hmm. And you need to play with those two things. Uh, because when you have the ability to, to move those two objects of what you're looking at and what's looking at you, you can find that balance and sweet spot of, of looking at a, a camera and just behind there, there's the person you're talking to or whatever you need. Yeah. Emily, what were you gonna say? Yeah, I was gonna say um, kind of similar, but uh, less impressive sounding. Uh, sticky notes, uh, when you figure out where your eyeline works or uh, like if you have to point to something, like if, when Erin uh, talks about the chat when she's doing introductions, she always like points up to the place and she actually has like a chat bubble sticky note directly mm -hmm. where she needs to point. Um, so it's it's taking the time beforehand to like work with your webcam, work with your monitors, and then like give yourself help. Like if I'm doing a, mm -hmm. uh, let's say like an introduction, I'll uh, make that text window like the amount of uh, width that my eyes can comfortably scan while still looking at the camera and like all the way up as close to where my camera is as possible so that when I'm reading it, I like am suitably engaged. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's like taking that time beforehand to work out those those kinks. One of the similarly, like if you've got like, so I'll show a couple of things, I've got a couple of visuals. So I've got like this guy, this is a small tripod foot selfie, looks like a weapon most of the time, but, uh, and phone holder. Um, but that if you like right now, like right about there is where everybody is. In some cases, like if you're gonna use a camera that can be in front of your monitor, just like, literally put the camera at eye line with the person that you're performing against. Like take it mm -hmm. off of it. Like this is one of the reasons, this is what you're saying in terms of external cameras, like put it in the place where it needs to be. So that is at the right place for somebody else's eye. Because even if like right now I can be looking at my webcams at the top of my camera, like it's still getting me in a slightly up position because I'm, it's like I'm looking at someone who's slightly taller than me because my monitor is set here. So if I was performing, I'd, I'd not that I am not a performer, but if I were like engaged in like talking directly to somebody, I would actually put this in front of me right here. I can see through and see the person talking well enough better there and engage with them more directly one to one with a, with a screen in the middle without having to force my head up away from them um, than there. So those are like easy hacks. I saw someone made one out of Lego. <laughs> or they like, just like check their webcam and like dropped it into the middle of their screen to like yeah. cantilever it over. Um, having That's great. And having external monitors to look at it too. We've been doing a puppet piece. Let's see if it's worth sharing this. We've been doing a puppet piece where the the um, the performer and a puppet, I guess two performers and the director, uh, are in two different locations. 
And so the uh, because this is someone who has done work uh, in muppeteering, not just puppeteering, Sebastiano here, um, he's already set up with like, they only ever perform like the secret trick about the Muppets. They're only ever performing to, they're watching a monitor and doing everything in reverse. And so that they know what the eye line looks like. So we set up monitors so that you can pull the eye line to the right place and you can see where you land when you combine yourself with somebody else is helpful to also checking things. Uh, so we have like one minute left uh, before I bring Andrew back in because I'm still managing this stream. Uh, <laughs> How's it going? Uh, it's going great. Uh, <laughs> And so I'm just going to throw in this one because I think it's going to be kind of quick. Are there any recommendations for entry-level mics for better audio recording quality, which won't break the bank? Any. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, honestly, anything is better than than your like laptop's built-in mic. Um, I'd say entry-level blue snowball mm -hmm. is cheap. Uh, I've had the Yeti and I've use the snowball and I honestly could barely tell the difference but I don't think as much as I love my Yeti it's worth that extra money got a blue snowball it's under a hundred dollars plugs in by USB and for things that you don't need an extensive audio setup I think it will fulfill most of your needs yeah audio technica also makes uh, a nice one it looks like a, an sm58 but it has both USB and XLR on the back. Mm. So you can use it as a USB mic, but then if your setup gets fancier at some point and you want an external audio interface or you're like bringing it to a traditional theater, you can just like stick an XLR in the back and it'll also work. And it's, it's under a hundred as well, or maybe I'm clearly bad at prices. So it's probably like a little bit more than a hundred dollars. Yeah. I'm, I've got a, um, the, the ones on the webcams are not any good, even if the webcam is pretty good. The one the mics on the webcams are usually I find are tinier and not as good as the uh, mics even on the laptop. Depends on the laptop, I suppose. I, I've got a blue Yeti on a broadcast arm over here. I don't have it because it just lands in front of my face, so I didn't get it set up in time. Um, but I've got it hanging out over my arm for uh, some things. No, some people are not like, and that's like. Let's say 150, like for because there's the two versions of it. So that's like 150 for it. I would say the the thing that I've noticed about the blue Yeti is that like it comes with like a a, a table stand, and like you touch the table and it hears it. Like it is so sensitive, you have to get hands off. So it's nice to put it on a broadcast arm. Um, if you can get some suspension, like what Logan has, like these are the ways that you start to upgrade it. For my day-to-day -day stuff and what I'm talking to you on now, which usually sounds pretty good, I got a, and I originally got it because I'd bring like in remote guests when I was teaching. Um, and I could connect my laptop, but the audio was always a problem there. It's effectively the same issue that, um, uh, that uh, I got like a desktop conferencing mic. Um, which I could show you, but then you couldn't hear me because I'd have to unplug it. Um, it's what my primary one is. So it's a basic, it just shows up as a USB mic, but it's meant for like, if you were in a conference room to get a bunch of people around it. And it just sounds a lot better than either one of the tiny, tiny mics. It's a, it's a bigger condenser. It's better at like ranging a bit. Because uh, uh, especially when you get away from this, uh, the things, the, the, the mics just open up like crazy. But even... Um, like most headphone jacks on your laptop now, if you don't have a discrete mic, they have they have the three rings on it. It's a T R R S, two R's, two S's. I can't remember now. I never remember which way to which which letter to add. But they, um, if you've got like the headset, one better anyway. But then like you can get like a wired lav even and clip it onto you. And you're gonna get better because it's gonna be right up against you. Um, Rode makes a nice one, R-O-D-E, or R-O with a thing through it, D-E, uh, makes a nice, like, wired lav that you can just put into most headphone jacks on, because they'll have the the ring for for that. Or you can even get a very simple USB to 3.5 millimeter. And just getting it closer to you with a decent quality condenser doesn't have to be wireless, doesn't have to be USB, doesn't have to be fancy. You can still stay well under 100 bucks and get much better audio than anything that's built into whatever your record other visual recording devices. 
Hi, I'm back. Oh, hello. <laughs> Welcome back. That's great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thank you, folks. This is great. Great conversations. Got a lot of questions, and uh, I think uh, we've answered them all, and there's probably still more questions. So if anybody in the audience wants to ask questions, you can always bug Ian. Connect with Toaster Lab and just keep asking him <laughs> questions. I'm sure he'll really love that. Um, thank you again for all coming out and uh, for sharing uh, your thoughts and what you've been doing and your tech. And thank you. It's been great. Thanks, uh, Thanks, Thanks. for having me. Yeah. And uh, I'll see you all anon. Uh, so everyone else, thank you very much for coming out and checking out this event. Um, if you enjoyed this event or any of the other events, please uh, don't hesitate to donate to the ADC. You can check that out on our website, ADC's website, uh, designers.ca, or on uh, canadahelps.org. Those are all places. Uh, we want to thank our event sponsor, CITT Alberta. You can check them out at uh, citt-alberta.org. Uh, check them out. Thank you so much for sponsoring this event. Uh, it's been great. Uh, so our next event is tomorrow at 1 p.m. We have games, performance, and uh, sorry, I've forgotten the title. Games, performance, and digital placemaking. There we go. Uh, with Milton Lim tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time. See you around at the rest of the uh, conference.